All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Gabriel. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Wave Networks for sponsoring today's breakfast. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about how to create a hassle project. I usually like to give talks that have like very theoretical background to it, but today I just want to give a more practical talk. Uh, also because I want to encourage people to contribute packages to the hassle. Yes, so I also want to, so one of the reasons I'm giving this talk is that I really want to encourage people to contribute to the Haskell community, and part of that is just learning how to author and maintain a new Haskell package. And it may seem a little bit scary at first, but it's actually not that hard, and it's fun, and one thing you're going to learn along the way is that um, Haskell people are very gracious in the open source community and fun to work with. A lot of people on, it's like, open source gets a bad reputation where if you have a popular package, you get a lot of like trolls or bad people commenting sort of like ruining your day or, or, or asking for free work. Uh, it has to be, I feel, it's like nothing like that. A lot of the issues I get with people are like very helpful, huge requests, support. And very often you can just like give someone, some random person the commit bit and they'll just take it to heart and start just offering commits to the, your project for free. And I just find this really fascinating. And we're just that too. Um, anyway, so, uh, the first part, I have slides here, but I would actually like the first part of the talk to sort of just be a live demo of like setting up a Haskell project using a command line interface. So before I begin, just to take a temperature of the room, how many people here have uh, published a package to Hackage? Okay, a few people, good. How many people have used Stack, the build tool? Okay, everybody here, excellent. So the first part of this talk is just going to be, actually it's going to be primarily a Stack tutorial for people who don't know Stack. Um, and then the second part of the talk will be sort of like tips and tricks for publishing, maintaining packages and trying to get people to adopt them. So yeah, so the first part of the talk will be like how to bootstrap a package for private use, like your own hobby project or internally for a company. Then we'll move on to like, you know, how do you publish it as open source, get people to use it, set up CI. And then at the end of the talk, I'll talk about like publishing it to Hackage, Stackage, and what that involves and how to maintain projects uh, as time goes on. So, um, if has, so Stack has a really nice page. It's called, I think, just go to haskellstack.org. And it's instructions on how to use it, how to download it. Here's just a one line thing you can use to install it on your computer. If you're not familiar with Stack, uh, it's basically uh, it's similar to Cabal in a sense. So, uh, in the sense that it's a build tool. But one of the big differences between uh, Stack and Cabal is that it basically uh, isolates the entire Haskell tool chain for you. In fact, you can have different versions of the Haskell tool chain on a per project basis. And so that feels a really nice feature that makes it very easy to switch and test different versions of the compiler. And it also is nice because it doesn't contaminate your system path, which is really nice if I want to keep my system clean. So let's say you were to download and install Stack and you want to set up a new project. So the sort of the minimal project, you can I can have several template projects here. I'm just going to delete them and start from scratch. Sorry. All right, so let's create a new hello project directory. So you do that. And let's say I have, so usually my Haskell projects all start off as single file Haskell scripts that I compile and run with GHC. And at some point I decide, you know, this script has gone a little bit too complex. I need to now patch and package it up into a Haskell package. And so the first step of that is just creating a cabal file. So let's call this a hello.cabal. And the minimal cabal file is just a package name. So hello, a version, we'll say 1.0.0, this program is ready for the open world. And then a build type, uh, simple. And if you're not familiar with the internals of cabal, the cabal has different kinds of ways that you can build projects. And in build type simple, it just looks, it basically has a, a default uh, way of building, testing, and deploying your project. But it also lets you customize your project as well. So you'll find that like more complex Haskell packages. So every Haskell package should really have a setup.hs file that looks something like this. Import distribution.simple. Uh, I didn't know this until I memorized it for today's talk. So usually I just copy and paste this between projects if I forget what it is. And uh, but what happened, this file is actually where you can customize Cabal. And so you know Cabal often offers lots of build books. So you can say like Cabal build, Cabal test. Cabal install, Cabal clean, Cabal s disk, Cabal upload, Cabal, and so, and so forth and so forth. And the setup of the HS file is you customize what each of those commands do if you don't want the default behavior. And so if you want to do that, that file is more good to do it. But right now we're basically telling Cabal we just want the default behavior, which is build type simple. And because we're just going to create an executable, we'll just call it executable hello. And we say, okay, the main file is main.hs. And then I think it's build depends. We just say base is less than five, and then we should be good to go. Let's see if this works. 
So this is if we're using Cabal's equals to stack. Okay, build type simple. Uh, okay, it needs to be capital S simple. Okay. Thank you. Cabal. All right, and so now we can then say, as example, Cabal run, and then open hello world. So now we want to make this project stack aware. We add one more file, which is the stack.yaml file. And the absolute minimal stack.yaml file is just a resolver. In this case, LPS stands for long-term support and then has versions like B20. And then you can also, if you want to be good height, it's good height, you can also create a package scale, which basically means that our project has one source package as a dependency, which is our current directory. And this, is, and if you omit the packages field, that's the default behavior too. And then, so we can now run stack build, and then it will deliver our project. You are those warnings, and then we can say stack exec hello, and print hello world. And so, one thing that's cool about stack is that stack actually works. In, you can have a headless project with stack. So, for example, let's say I don't want to have any packages, any source packages I'm building. So I can say packages is empty, and I can just say like you know stack build pipes or whatever. My favorite packages, and then stack will just build it for you. So this is a nice way to if you just say, I want stack just for the resolver. I don't actually want to build my own custom source package. This is a cool trick you can use just to get that sort of behavior. But anyway, let's go back to having a local package. And so one of the first things you do as a project container is you need to oh sorry, you have a question? Yeah, I didn't understand that syntax, like the dash, oh. uh whatever it was. Oh, yeah. sorry. So um so this is the YAML file. And so in YAML files, the way you're, there's several ways you can represent uh, lists. One way is using like list notation, A, B, C, D. Another way you can do it is like A, B. So that's what, so the dash is basically in, indicating a list entry. And then the dot is a path. In this case, it's like a Unix path and you're pointing to the current directory. Um, so let's like pick up any .hs files in the current directory. It pick up any Cabal package located. Directory. So it specifically looks for a, a package structured as a Cabal project. Um, and you, one thing you might be wondering is like, so what's the difference between like Stack and Cabal? There's some subtle differences. Um, one is that Cabal was sort of built from the ground up to, for managing Haskell packages, so like one package standalone, whereas Stack was sort of designed to be from the ground up to be designed for managing projects, in other words, collections of Haskell packages. And so they both can technically do either one. But uh, I find that stack tends to be slightly better for project management compared to default. And I'll be showing some differences uh, in just a second. So let's say I want to add a dependency to my project. So hello.cobol. So in this case, let's say I want to add my project called Turtle. Turtle is just a scripting library which provides uh, sorry, some utilities. So once I add it as a dependency there, then I can modify my main.hs and I can now import the Turtle model module from that package. And I'll, let's I'll just use the sleep function from that library. So sleep one. And then if I do stack build, it should pick that up and then compile it. And then if I say stack exec hello, then it should wait a second and then print hello. Perfect. And one of the cool things about, so one of the things that differentiates Haskell community from uh, a lot of other language systems is that when you specify dependencies, you specify dependency ranges. So I can say, so you can first off, let's visit the turtle package. I don't know, can people see, is this large enough? Make it a little bigger? Okay, here we go. How's that? Okay, so this is the turtle package. If you want to see what version the package has, just go to, I usually just search, in fact, one little tip if you're for the um, new people at Haskell, whenever you want to search for anything in the Haskell community, just prefix it with hackage uh, when you're doing a Google search. Even if you don't think it's going to be on hackage, that often improves the quality of the search dramatically. So if I want to just uh, like learn about how to deal with um, benchmarks or tests in, ha in Haskell, I'll just say like hackage tests or hackage benchmarks. Uh, it's a very nice trick to just improve quality search results. But anyway, so I search for package turtle, so that takes me to the turtle library. And here we can see all the versions available. And I might want to say like, I only want version, I only want to depend on turtle greater than 1.3 because like something that some function depending on was only introduced in version 1.3. So I can say for you, for example, turtle is greater than 1.3. If I depend on another version, then it will fail. But now suppose that, so you might wonder, okay, so what happens if, if I don't include the version? How does the compiler, or how does the package manager pick which version of Turtle to use? And the answer is, it depends on what build tool you use. So in Cabal's case, what it does is Cabal is essentially a dependency solver. It will basically go through your package and all those dependencies, look at the dependency ranges that they specify, and see like what's a set of packages that satisfies all the dependencies and use something like an SMT solver to figure out what's, what solutions there are. And then it sort of picks newer ones if it can. 
Uh, stack works in a completely different mechanism. Stack actually just goes ahead and picks the ver uh, specific versions of all your dependencies for you. And the way it knows which ones to pick is by the resolver that you specify. So here, for example, when we pick this resolver, we're pinning all of our dependencies to specific versions. And we can actually find out what those versions are by going to a specific site. So if you go to stackage.org slash, in this case, LTS uh, dot dash 8.8 slash cabal.config, you can see what package version stack will pick for all your dependencies. So I want to see what version of turtle I'm getting. It says, okay, here a turtle is, sorry. Your turtle is version 1.3.2. And you'll tend, and Stackage by default will try to pick the newest versions of all libraries. And what's really cool about the way Stackage works is that, uh, so Stackage is basically is a curated set of packages that are known to build together. Meaning that if you pick these versions, you won't have any dependency resolution failures and you won't have any build failures. So you're guaranteed, your project will always build. It might not necessarily pass tests, but it will still build. So that's a very useful thing. And that was actually a big issue that the Haskell ecosystem had before the introduction of Stack. Because usually, uh, if you maintain a project, you get to pick between one of two not so good alternatives. The first alternative was Cabal would pick your dependencies for you using its version solver. But the problem with that is that as people publish new versions of the package, then Cabal would automatically pick those up. And then sometimes that would cause dependency resolution failures or sometimes even build failures. And that led to non reproducible builds. Then some people decide, okay, well, Cabal has a freeze option, which lets you basically take whatever was the recent solution and just freeze that and use that forever until I change it again. And that worked okay, so like it gives you a reproducible build right now. But then like as all your packages start to you know, have published newer versions, it's hard to then you have to like repeat the whole process of like finding a good set of versions that work for all your dependencies and then freezing them again. And that's very time consuming. And so uh, and so what they did for Stackage is they just said, like, you know what, we'll do that process for you. We're just gonna try and find a large set of packages that all build together and we'll try to keep them as up-to-date as possible. Then we'll publish that list as a resolver. And then you can consume that resolver and just say, I'm gonna just use these packages as much, much as possible. Um, and so that just greatly reduces the maintenance burden for people who maintain packages with large numbers of dependencies. Um, but sometimes you need to be able to deviate from the dependencies that uh, Stackage picks for you. So let's say, for example, I don't want Turtle 1.3.2. Let's say I want Turtle 1.3.1 for whatever reason. So let's see what happens if I specify that in my file. So let's say I say Turtle has to be 1.3.1. I do stack build. It'll say, okay, failure. So it says, like, I want to put 1.3.2, but that's not consistent with this project. So if the build fails, we resolve it somehow. And one way we can resolve that is we can tell Stack, you know what? You, I want to use all your resolvers dependencies except for one, which is Turtle. I'm going to pick a new version. So I can go into the stack.yaml file here and we do something called an extra depths section. And this basically says it lets you deviate from stack's deep, uh, the resolver's default choices. So I can say here, I want Turtle 1.3.1. Uh, so extra depths is useful for two reasons. It, you can use it both to change the version of a package that is in that long dependency list that the resolver chose. You can also use it to add new packages that are not present in that list. The package doesn't cover all the package, right? It just covers a very large set of packages, like, I don't know, like 95% of packages or something like that. Oh, all except the most common, like 1,000 packages. Um, but sometimes, you know, some packages are not in that list. If you want to use them, you can also add them in the same extra depth section if you just, if you want to depend on them. The only disadvantage to adding packages here is this. Basically, now you're responsible for ensuring that they will build, they will correctly have, you know, satisfy dependency resolution and so forth. So you're basically saying, I'm willing to do that, you know, uh, and take some extra responsibility for my project. Um, so this is just a nice trick if you want to deviate from the default choices for a given resolver. Yes? So, oh, so the question was, do you need to put one, the 1.3.1 1 choice in both files? And the answer is uh, no. So I could actually go back to my um, hello.cabal file, I can just get rid of this right here, and it will still pick turtle 1.3.1. In fact, you might wonder, like, why do I have to specify dependencies in two places, right? Why does it do it in my cabal file? Why does it do it in my stack file? And the answer is because, uh, well, part of it is just lazy the Haskell ecosystem. You know, cabal came first, cabal did dependencies and specified in the cabal file. Stack came second, it specifies in the stack.yaml. Um, what I find in practice, what a lot of people do is that if you're writing an application like internally within a company, you'll just leave off the dependency ranges in your Cabal file and you'll let Stack just pick versions for you. And typically when you open source or publish a package to Hackage, then what you'll do is you'll just try to uh, put uh, dependency bounds on your dependencies and use Cabal. Because remember that 
Stack is a project manager, right? And Cabal is more like, at least the Cabal file is more of a package description. So when you, so when people, so people, when you publish a package, you're only publishing the package description. You're not publishing the stack.yaml. So that's why you still need to have those dependencies in there. So again, like, uh, it, yeah, it's a little bit complicated, but basically the point is that like packages need to specify what the dependencies need to be. Otherwise, they need, otherwise there's a chance they may not build. But projects also need to specify what dependencies go together. Otherwise, they might not, might not build. So that's why you need to specify information in two places. Uh, it's not ideal, but like that's the current state of the ecosystem. So yes. Would you at that point see um, Oh, oh, so actually, yes. So the question was, uh, can you take the versions that Stackage picks and put them in the Cabal file? And the answer is yes. In fact, remember that file that, that we just visited right here, this Cabal again, big file? You can literally just do this. W get that URL into your project, and then Cabal will automatically pick up that file and use that for picking package versions. So this is a nice way to get the benefits of Stackage when using Cabal in terms of just selecting package versions. You still want to use the Cabal tool proper. Uh, so this is a nice a trick if you don't want to use the stack tool for building your projects. Oh, so the, so the, the clarification was like, do you want to? So can you then add these to your package description so that when you publish your library, you, you freeze all your dependencies? Um, so I don't. So yes, again, you could just save the cabal. I think you could just save the cabal like a big file and then package it with your um, package to make sure it gets picked up. Uh, I would not recommend that. I don't recommend freezing your dependencies and publishing a package. Otherwise, nobody will ever use your package because they may want to use a different version of one of your dependencies. It would conflict. So generally, when you publish, you want to specify just a range of dependencies so, so that you're as flexible and incorporating with other dependencies that you may need to have the own ranges. Well, I guess still the question is, so what would you put on the range? Initially, you're letting, oh. you're letting stack yes. just pick, and now you're going to publish. You need to put some range. So the question is, what do you put for the range? Uh, if you're not sure, so what I usually do, if I have absolutely no idea, is I take whatever is the current version, and I make it the lower bound, and then I make whatever is the next uh, major, sort of next breaking change, and make that the non-inclusive upper bound. And so I know that that will, because I know that the current version works. And I know that if we satisfy the package version policy or PDP, then I should not get any breaking changes up to the non-inclusive version 1.4. So that's how I usually set my version by default. And then if I'm really diligent, like I'll go through what API functions I consume from the library and then see what versions they were included in, then maybe lower my lower bound a little bit. Uh, that makes it, again, that's, that's better if you can do that and invest the effort. I might, I wouldn't spend too much time on it if it's very time consuming for you because what you'll find is that when you publish a package to package, a, a lot of people will then come along and then like issue pull requests to change your routes for you and fix it. People are very generous like that in the Haskell community. So uh, people will do your work for you once you open source your package. All right, so where was it? Oh yeah, so another thing is that uh, in Stack you can also depend on, um, so, so again, you can depend not just on the current directory, but other directories as source packages. So say I have a local checkout of the Turtle library. So instead of here, I want to say I have a local checkout of Turtle located at um, users slash Gabriel slash fraud slash Turtle. Actually here, the reason I want to do that is because you also want to specify this extra def true. Then it should, if I do this correctly, yeah, it should pick up now my local source checkout of Turtle and then use that as a dependency. That lets me like, let's say if I want to like patch something in Turtle and then test it works in my library, this is a good way of doing that. Um, if it's on GitHub and you just wanted to, so let's say you like made a pull request to some author on GitHub, they haven't bothered publishing the package yet, I'm guilty of doing this all the time. Uh, and you still want to depend on the thing on GitHub, you can do that too. So you can say, for example, so I'm on packages, then you have a location, and you say, oops, sorry. So git, and let's say, let's go to the GitHub repository for turtle. You call it a download, here we go. So copy that, and you, I think, is it revision? I, I have to look this up every time. Uh, I have it here just in case, commit, there we go. So commit, whatever was the latest version. Uh, I don't know, here we go. Then that should pick it up, and then build using the turtle that is on GitHub, if I did that correctly. Oh, sorry, not Cabal build, set build. There you go. So clone it, build it, and now I'm going to depend on that as a source dependency. 
And one thing you might notice is I added like a little extra depth field when depending on like another source package. So Stackage is actually supports having uh, multiple root projects, not just one root project. So if you don't, so if you have a source package where you don't specify extra depth is true, then oh, it looks like there is some sort of a build error. So I gotta fix that. So it looks like master is broken on uh, <laughs> for my Latin repositories. I need to fix that. But the point is that um, you have multiple root source packages. Packages and Stack will try to build all of them and, and consult and then provide different log outputs and test outputs for each one of them. But if you want to say like this is a dependency and not really a root project, then you just add extra depth equals true, and that improves generally the build output of Stack. Um, yeah. All right. So going back to what we had before. All right. So the next thing we need to do is um, oh yeah. So let's say you don't want to create a project from scratch like I just did. Yeah. Uh, so you can also you can let Stack create the project for you. So Stack has a uh, nice utility which is called Stack New. Let's go up one directory and say Stack New Hello to. And this will create a new project template. This is very nice if you're just creating projects pretty quickly. This is a good place to be in. Uh, and then so it creates you know a source directory for your library code, and then it creates an app directory for your top level executables, and it creates a test directory for your tests. And also it templates the Cabal file for you. Cabal has a similar utility. I think it's called like Cabal in it or Cabal new for also creating a blank project template um, that you can fill out like this. Uh, and then what's really cool is that you can then do things like, um, what I'm going to point out here. Uh, oh, sorry. So one thing you can do is then you can say, um, this one feature of Stack I really like, which is called File Watch. You don't know this. So you can say Stack, you give it any Stack command like Stack Build or Stack Test. If you pass the File Watch flag, then Stack will update, we'll rebuild and retest the project anytime a file changes, right? So here I'm going to actually put this in a separate window so you can watch it side by side. One second. Here we go. I should make this smaller so you can see it at the same time. Oops, this is now too small. Let me close that and open up a new window. Okay, so now let's say I update my library code, right? So I say now instead of put string subline font, I say hello world here, I save the file, then you can see the project automatically builds on the side, and I can see my project type checks, test pass, and then this is a nice way to get really quick feedback and use the command line dev workflow like I do. Um, another thing you can do, and this is very handy when you're publishing packages, is very often I'm too lazy to set up to create like a my own you know, test, uh, three separate test modules for every new function that I publish. So I like to just include the test in line using Haskell's doc test library. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add, first I'm gonna add to my test suite doc test, so I can use the library. Then I'm going to add, I'm going to say import test dot doc test, then change this to main equals, and then you can specify which files you want to talk to. I think you can also specify entire directories, but I don't remember if that works or not. So doc test, that's just recompiling. Right now there are no tests to run. I haven't added any yet. But while that's building, I'm just going to go ahead and start adding the doc test right here, which says that if I run some funk, it should output hello world. I can also add tests that are completely unrelated to my current function. Like if I type one plus one, I should get two. And then if I save that, it'll now run both tests. You see, try two, no errors. And now I can deliberately introduce an error, goodbye. And then when it runs the test, it'll let me know that there's a mistake. There we go, there's a test failure. This is a very lightweight way of adding tests to your code. And it's also great for packages because then the tests show up in the documentation and the machine checks you know that they're up to date. So this is very nice when you're publishing packages for other people to consume as well. And um, let's see, going back to the talk. Okay, so let's go here. Oh, one thing about stack uh, template support is that uh, there's more than just the default template, right? So if you write stack templates, it'll list out what are the available templates for you. And you can add your own, you can add them if you want to. Some people even name their own templates after themselves, like Chris Dunn here or Franklin Chen. Um, they're templates for GACJS, so if you want to compile Haskell to JavaScript, it'll set up all that scaffolding for you. And other useful templates. My favorite one is simple. <laughs> I love this one because it just creates like a single executable and that's it. So it's a very lightweight template that I use all the time. Um, I don't know what the name of the default uh, template is. Oh, the, oh, so somebody said the default template is new template. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mentioned file launch, doc test. Um, also, if you want to follow these links, I'm going to post these slides after the talk. I have them on GitHub, so I have a repository on GitHub, uh, Gabriel439, my slides repository. This is under Bayhack 2017. So if you want to find any of these links or I'll look at these slides later on, that's where you can find them. 
Um, there's also, like I mentioned, there's a package version policy if you're new to Haskell. Um, and Haskell works a little bit different from other use systems in that the first two numbers of a version indicate uh, changes to the first two numbers indicate a breaking version change. If you want to do a non-breaking change, you change at least the third or fourth number. And that's just because a Haskell ecosystem, you know, we break things all the time because the type system finds our errors and then we can fix them really easily anyway. It's not like Ruby where, you know, if you have a breaking change, you can just like silently break your program and it'll still run. Right, so we don't have to, so we, we tend to be more aggressive about breaking things, but we need them. We now have two numbers for managing breaking changes. And usually the rule of thumb is that, you know, the first number is like a breaking change where you want to have a big announcement about it, like a blog post or some announcement you send to a mailing list. And the second number is like a more minor breaking change where it's like, oh, I added some field to some record that you probably don't use anyways, but it's technically a breaking change, so I gotta change it. You know, you don't want to make a lot of fuss about it. Um, also, a good thing to do when you publish a project, add a readme. And what's cool about the default stack template is that it will also make sure to include the readme in your, so this important line right here is called extra source files, and then make sure that it's bundled with your uh, hackage package, and then hackage will automatically render the readme uh, in the documentation. So we can see an example of this in the lens package. So if we go to hackage lens, you can see there's, yeah, that just is fine. So in a package, there are basically four different fields that are useful for documenting your package. So one is the synopsis. So if you go to the Cabal file, there you go these two commented fields right here, synopsis and description. The synopsis is like a one-line one tag that you go see here at the top, just summarizing your package. And then the description is this stuff right here at the top of the package after the, after the title. And then after the description, you can see lens is this long, large flow chart, which is really, really intimidating. And then it'll say like skip to readme, which means that if you included the readme, you can also view that, which is at the very bottom of this page, which has in this case the exact same diagram again. So lens, lens includes both. <laughs> but this is really useful because some projects, they want to have just their information in one place and then use it both in, on GitHub and on Hackage, so they'll include just a readme. They'll include no description, and then so the Hackage will then just include a link saying skip to the readme, so you can just use a readme for both GitHub and Hackage. So that's a nice time saver for people who like to do that. Um, all right, so back to here. Another thing you can do is include change logs. So package will automatically pick that up and add it to the change log field. So for example, you know, lens has a change. So if we go again to the lens package, you can see that it added a change log as an extra source file, and then it shows up. Where is it? Here we go. It has a change log field here, which is very useful. So you can add, basically see what is new in each version. And useful things to include in the change log if you add one are um, bugs that were fixed. So people know that if they have a bug, what's the lower bound they need to add to the package. And if you change uh, a, if you have a breaking change that involves changing one of the first two version numbers, explain why in your change log so people know that they need to, uh, if they need to put an upper bound or not on your kind of see. Um, if you ever use CI and use Travis specifically for your GitHub project, I highly recommend the multi JC Travis project. It ensures that it builds your project. You can test it multiple JC versions, and it will ensure that it tests it also each one with the same version of Cabal that was bundled with that JC. So it very accurately simulates what other people will what happen to other people when they try to build your package. So I highly recommend this if you're publishing things to package for other people to consume. Uh, and the project has very good documentation on how to use it and set it up for Travis. And finally, um, Please, if you document your project, add at least one end-to-end -end example of how to use your project to your headaches. This is really important. It'll save your users a lot of time, and a lot of people forget to do this. So please just do that <laughs> if you publish a package that package. <laughs> and then here's another other useful things to document is like try to get 100% headache coverage. Uh, please uh, try to add a readme. And if you have more time, it's useful to like add tutorials, or maybe write a blog post and help in the library, explain the motivation and context and so forth. And then finally, if you want to upload a package, you can just create a user account. So package has a way you can uh, register requests for a new user account. And then when you have that account, you just say stack upload the current directory, and then it will pull us for your username and password and publish the package. And then if you do that again, it'll reduce your credentials to get to the first time for subsequent uploads, which is very convenient. And then uh, common issues are like, if you don't see the latest version of your package, it's because your browser cached the landing page, it's there, even if you don't see it. Um, another common issue is your documentation doesn't render correctly. This used to be a big problem for a long time. And you can actually, you can use, uh, using Cabal, you can say Cabal upload dash dash doc. I think Stack will add the same feature soon. So you can just manually build it up with the documentation if you need to fix it. Uh, this is a very handy feature. 
And then finally, if you want to add your package to Stackage, there's basically, there's a maintainer's agreement. You should follow it basically says like, you should try to, you know, every once in a while, we'll send out an email that looks something like, here's an example, this is what I got recently. So HUnit recently updated to version 1.6.0. They send a bunch of people, they mentioned a bunch of people on GitHub saying, you need to update your upper bound on HUnit so that you can build against this latest version. And I was one of the people that was pinged on that. And then people go fix their dependencies and then they, just, and then they keep track of uh, when they've all been fixed. So if you ever add your package to stack and you're going to get emails like this saying, please update your upper bounds, please update your upper bounds. This is why Michael Slayman always complains a lot about people having upper bounds because it creates a lot of work like this, but I still think it's a good idea to add upper bounds. <laughs> and then I think that's it. That's the end of the talk. So unless people have any other questions, then we're done.